trading is about knowing the field. Foreseeing the opportunity. Executing at the right moment. Timing is everything. Hello everybody and a very warm welcome to The Good, The Bad and The Rugby in partnership with City Index, the leading provider of spread betting, CFD and FX trading and my word, now we are touring. Six shows in eight days, we're currently in Manchester, ready to go on stage with Mark Cueto. And off the back of last week's pod, where we brought you an inspirational chat with the former England hooker Dylan Hartley, this week we're checking in again with another former England number two, Steve Thompson. And I'm sure by now you know that Steve is battling as bravely off the field with his early onset dementia as he did on the pitch as an England World Cup winner. It's important to stress before we bring you the interview that we did in Liverpool that some of the content is extremely sensitive and so we do want to just issue a quick trigger warning that we do go into some deep mental health issues and also the topic of suicide. But it was a truly remarkable evening, hugely inspirational in the way that he's dealing with his current challenges and also incredibly entertaining with a man who has been there and almost done it all. So let's bring you the very best of Steve Thompson in partnership with us in Liverpool. But before that, it was a show that began with the usual nonsense. It is interesting because obviously, you know, the rugby culture, people associate it with drinking. But your, you know, drink is the only thing. You know, when you, you come out a night out, you go, I'm not drinking. I'm going, the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean, right? It's the weirdest mentality, isn't it? Oh, I'm just going to have one. What's, yeah. the, what's, yeah. the point, what's the point in having it? What's the one? point in having it? What's the point? Why don't you, you might as well stay at home. Um, <laughs> but we, yeah, sorry. But, you know, it was like, uh, who was the one, uh, uh, guy at Wasp who never drank, but you, you just punished him in other ways? Uh, it, not words. Who, oh, Tom Reese. Oh, Tom, uh, Tom, Tom Reese, yeah. No, but uh, Tom, Tom Reese is a great story. So, my early days at Wasp, Tom Reese, fantastic player, played a few times for England. Unfortunately, his career got cut short through injuries. Now a doctor. But his early days, uh, well, there's a couple of things in. We called him Tom Reese, um, and I was bored, which is always dangerous. And I remember talking to one of the lads, going, Oh, you know, Reese? Obviously, all the lads like, Yeah. I went, You know, he, um, he joined in Robot Wars with his, he built a robot, right? And entered the TV show Robot Wars. And the lads are like, um, Really? And I was like, Yeah, yeah, no, he built it. He called it like the Turbinaws 5000, and he made it, and he competed. And it was just completely made up. But I created this whole fabricated story to the point where they started calling him <laughs> Robot Nors. <laughs> and it just made up this whole story about it. And to the point where it obviously didn't drink. Went out on a night out. We won the Heineken, I won the Premiership in the Heineken Cup. I'll never forget we're in a bar. And that was the time that I, they said it was Hawaiian dress, right? So I turned up in um, Hawaiian shirt, <laughs> jeans, and flip flops. And my mate, this guy called James Wellwood, who went to Harrow, tur turned up in a Hawaiian shirt, shorts, and church's shoes. Interesting combo, but really expensive <laughs> church's shoes, like 500 quid each, you know? And we walked in the door, and Fraser Waters goes, fucking hell, Haskell. That's not Hawaiian. And I went, no, it, it is. It's got a shirt. Fuck off. Cut his trousers off, right? <laughs> Someone produced a pair of scissors, I don't know where. <laughs> that is always the other thing about rugby players. So you can always produce any implement yeah. that needs to be done. Someone, <laughs> someone's got a toolbox. And they've cut, and these were Christmas present jeans, right, that I got, and, you know, and I was like, oh, it's not, I know, mum had bought them for me, again. Um, and they cut, they stabbed the scissors in my trousers, <laughs> right, and then Phil Greeny and Trevor Leota, the big dick fingers, <laughs> got into the jeans, just tore them off, right? So I was wearing hot pants. <laughs> In this bar, right? I'm only like 19. And like, you've never looked back. You've never looked back. Saturday, right? Right? So standing, I'm, suits. I'm sitting there and, and they've gone, Wellwood, it was not fucking Hawaiian, right? And Wellwood's gone, you right in the store, right? And they've gone, right. And they cut his shoes, 500 quid each, right? <laughs> and they cut his shoes into flip flops. <laughs> <laughs> but obviously, not being professional cobblers. <laughs> <laughs> he, he got up, he got up, and as he got up to walk, his feet just fell out of them, right? <laughs> but not to be perturbed, they were like, well, we can fix that, we can fix that. Pulled out some medical tape, I don't know where from, <laughs> and they strapped the shoes to his feet. And he looked like he had calipers on, right? <laughs> and I'm walking over hot pants, and as we'd gone out of the bar later, Paul Volley came up behind me, pulled the boxer shorts up and tore them off, right? <laughs> Using my 
penis is a fulcrum. <laughs> not great, not great, you know. Um, and, and I'm then now having to walk round the King's Road in London, a bit like Alan Partridge with the boys out the barracks, <laughs> with just testicles. And while I couldn't, I couldn't help, you know. I tried balancing one on the other. <laughs> because, because uh, it, you know, I know that was like early, what was that early sort of, uh, no, it must be 2000. Uh, four, five. So that was terrifying enough. But then Reese was at this place, and they'd walked in, and he was sitting there in the corner, trying to, you know, because he'd seen what happened to me. I'd been fed to the walls. He'd seen Wellwood in the calipers, and he was sitting there, he was nursing a coke. And um, I remember Phil Greening looking over at Reese. Do you want a beer? He's like, Well, no, um, actually, I, I'm probably not going to drink today. I don't really drink. And they were like, Fuck off, oi! Hit him till he drinks. <laughs> right. <laughs> Simon Shaw's got him in a headlock, Trevor Leo and Phil Green are punching him, <laughs> punching him on a body shot to do drinks. I drink, I drink. And it was like, honestly, out of the movie. He was like this. <laughs> and then it was like, hit his lips. Four hours later, I walked in, he was being sick in the urinal. <laughs> and he then had to go to England on the 21s training the next day, right? He'd never drunk, he'd never been hungover. They'd forced him into it, he'd loved it. Turned up to England on 21 training, massive deal for me at the time. Trained at the absolute mm. fucking house down. Got man of, the, man of the, 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 the session. People had never seen him train better. He's never looked back. <laughs> and he went to medical school, I think, just for the drinking, <laughs> if I'm honest with you. Amazing. Yeah, so yeah, he's yeah, it's one of those what team boy. socials. What a player. Shall we bring up our main guest this evening? It's an absolute honour to have him with us tonight. One of the greatest players of his generation, of course, a World Cup winner. Ladies and gentlemen, would you give an enormous welcome, please, to Mr. Steve Thompson! Yeah, have it away. How are you, Steve? Oh, okay. Nice to see you. Have a seat. Steve Thompson, ladies and gentlemen. Woo. Yeah. Whip, whip, whip. An enormous round of applause, and quite rightly so. It, it, often we sort of throw out the how are you, but with you it's sort of got a bit more resonance and a bit more weight to it. It's very good to have you with us tonight. Um, you're a busy man. Not what are you trying to say? <laughs> yeah, not literally. <laughs> how are you though? How is life? No, I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's been a bit of a whirlwind the last week or so, you know. I've, I've actually tasted a bit of Haskell's life for a week, you know, book tours, talking shit. Um, it's, it's harder than you think, isn't it? <laughs> it is hard, I'm tired. It? I'm very tired from it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you've got the book out. We're actually selling it out front. If you haven't bought it, it's a really, really powerful, strong, amazing read. But you've been out promoting it, talking about it, going yeah. well? Um, I got asked to do a book a while ago, and I was, weren't interested in it whatsoever. And uh, obviously, with everything that's gone on in the last two years, um, there's a number of people that are suffering and stuff like that. So I thought someone's got to put their head up. Yeah. And I'm ugly enough to take it. So, um, you know, that's what I'd, I've done. And uh, I'm really, I was writing the book really for my kids. So I've got people adding into it. And that's when I was talking beforehand. And the last thing I want to do is when I die is people stand at my, uh, <laughs> at, the, at the church and start saying, he was such a good bloke. He was a nice bloke all the time. Is that because that's a lie? Right. I am an arsehole. It is, right. tr it is true. What that should they say? Me. Sorry? What should they say? He's an arsehole. <laughs> I, I, I said this before, we, we were talking about it, because I said, you know, you, know, <laughs> you, know, you know when all you see on the news, right, and they always go, oh, so-and-so's died, and there's a quote, he was lovely and they're amazing. No one's ever a dickhead, right? And on the, the sheer amount of people you meet, you know there's obviously dickheads worry, everywhere. No saying that at your funeral party. <laughs> That's what yeah. I mean, but I, I said that when I die, I want people to go, do you know what? He was a bit of a dick, he made a couple of people laugh, he tried his hardest, he'll be missed by a couple of people, but we'll probably all just move on. <laughs> But not at this whole like glowing thing. He changed people's lives. He was a hero. All right, calm down, fans. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. Um, in terms of obviously the book itself, has it been quite a therapeutic process? Have you quite enjoyed going back through it? What's, Do you know, what's I, been the... I, I loved it. John uh, Woodhouse, the ghostwriter. I used to meet him in. Um, I live not about half an hour from here. We used to meet in the pub, have breakfast and that in the morning, and um, I loved it. I still meet him now. The book's finished, but I still every week I meet him because it was. It's just nice talking to him and just sort of. I don't know, he just understands me, which is nice not having that routine have. as well, though. Yeah, exactly that. So it just sort of chills me out. I go there. He's a bit like a therapist that I don't have to pay for anymore. Yeah. I just have to literally <laughs> yeah. just get him a bit of breakfast. And it's, you know, he's there and he's like a beaten dog, bless him. But um, no, and he's, he just got me straight away. And yeah. when you're doing the book, you have to, he, he has to write a bit of a taster that you want to put out there and stuff like that. So when we were um, looking at 
that's when I this sort of thing. But I was having talked to all the book companies and stuff, and it actually went to an auction, which apparently not many sports books go to auctions. Wow. So it sort of went off. But Steph, my wife, and I were sat there in COVID, like I'm doing the Zoom calls, and there's me because. I'm at home, so I don't care. So I'm literally box shorts on and then a dress shirt and stuff like that. And we're just there talking to these publishing companies. And, like, and it's like, so why do you think you should be able to do my book? And talking, I'm just thinking, oh my God, what a wanker. I, must, I just sound like Haskett. Like, <laughs> just, you know what I mean? We're trying to, that's what we try and do. So we're there and Steph and I, we're just, you know, people that know Steph, she's like most laid back. She's a scouser. So that's why I, yeah, that's why I'm in, I believe in charity, but I don't believe that much to live in Liverpool. I live just outside. And we come in now and then. That's what we say. But uh, no, we, I, I, love, I love it. That's why I'm here. And, you know, 30 minutes from Liverpool, it's perfect. And she always tells me how great Liverpool is. And she always, well, the first thing her mum told me when I met was like, there's two teams in Liverpool. Do you know that? And I was like, well, yeah. And she went, yeah, Liverpool and Liverpool reserves. Right. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. Well, there might only be one team in the Premiership next year, might there? Yeah. Oh. How to get the crowd on side. Punchy, sir. <laughs> Punchy. Oh. I'll get this from a nine-year-old daughter, so... You're, yeah. in, you're in safe territory. If anyone territory. gets offended, just goes to dementia again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what did you say? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I wasn't even there. It wasn't me. It yeah, it was. What? I wasn't there. I wasn't there. <laughs> so when people ask you now, how would you describe your situation now? Um, it's been... A journey of understanding, to be honest. Like, yeah. I knew, I sort of knew there was problems um, before I got diagnosed. But you're just in denial and just thinking I'm fine, everything's fine, and and then suddenly you get the diagnosis and massive relief at first because it's like there, thank God there's a there's a problem. So I've, there's something I can fight against, you know. And you can either look at the like early onset dementia and it's a bit of a death sentence type thing, or it's a brain injury. And it's something I can fight, and we, we have a go against, and, we, and, and that's the way I, I've gone down. Yeah. And my neuro psychiatrist has told, told me, he said, Look, the thing is, your brain is like a Nokia battery, but an old one. So I just have to recharge it all the time. You have to rest a lot more. Whereas before, I wasn't doing that. So I was having a lot more sort of episodes and stuff. And, you know, I've openly said, you know, I've been close to suicide over the last year a couple of times, but they've got me on um, medication now. And it's, you know, I've had my life the way I look at it. I've got four young kids that I've got, a, and I also I don't want to be one of these energy sappers, which I'm doing right now. I'm sorry about that. No, this, this, no. that's not the case um, at all. But you know, when no, when you you phone your friend and like, oh, f I'm not talking to him. He's <laughs> fucking, like that. Yeah. But you know, for me, I've I've gone through it, and you know, I'm on the medication now, and it's just to level me out, so I can give my kids and my wife and my friends a better life and a better me, really. Because yeah. there's been a few years now that. I just didn't know what was going on, couldn't yeah. understand, and I'd just fallen apart a bit. Whereas now I'm trying to put that back together and just live life the best I can. Good on you. Amazing. Amazing. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. I was going to ask, um, in, in terms of the initial stuff, because obviously you know, I've been, I'm following your journey, and, and you know, I know, as you said, time's got um, dark recently, and we'll, we'll come on to that. But in terms of like, what, what was the actual symptoms? What, what, what were you noticing to start with? Like, what, was, what was actually happening? Um, it sort of started happening when I was in Dubai, working in Dubai, and like, I'd start going to meetings, and I'd just, I was coming out of meetings just thinking, I have not got a clue what's just gone on there. Like, not a clue, whereas before I was doing well, suddenly I started totally missing meetings, but then also like the social side to it, I just, just stopped completely going out and stuff like that. Was, in Dubai, it's quite a social place. You've been there. Yeah, it's, like, yeah. it's like a <laughs> Peter Pan type land, do you know what I mean? It's just everyone goes out all the time. and and. I just ended up just not wanting to do it. And then just, because of the memory stuff, started, my job started going downhill and I just, and getting angry and pissed off and that and just, so then in Dubai, if you don't work, you can't have a visa, you've got to leave. So suddenly I've got young kids in private school that I've got to sort of pull out. Life is going well and then suddenly we're in Cyprus and I'm just sitting there like in the back garden, sometimes in tears, sometimes just, just not knowing what was going on with me. Yeah. Um, and Steph, Steph was brilliant all the way through it, but you know, we were bickering a bit and stuff like that because I'd be, she'd be saying, I said I was going to do something. And I was like, no, I haven't. And it wasn't until the kids got that extra year older where they turned around and said, Dad, you did say you were going to do that. And Dad, you know, you haven't done that. And suddenly I was like, before that, I was like, no, no, my memory's fine. There's nothing wrong with my memory. But then suddenly going into denial and it was Alex Popham that called me and I was working up on site in uh, Kendall because I was 
uh, fixing the aqueducts during COVID and we're out in the middle of the field, beautiful. And uh, he phones me, starts explaining like all his symptoms. So I'm thinking, shit, you know, you're, you're explaining me here. And I was just like, Phew. so he said, look, why don't you go and get tested? So I said, yeah, all right. So I went and got tested and it took longer than it should have done. Well, not should have done, but just because of COVID. So there was plenty of different ones you had. And the one doctor specialist came out to the house and there's like a test and they give you 20 words, say 20 words, and you have to repeat them. And then you go off to other memory games and stuff. And then they go back to the same 20 words. She, you repeat them again. And she said, like, the top I score I got was like five. It was just, and then that was the first time I really thought I'm in trouble there. Oh, okay. And I kept apologizing because I broke down. I was just apologizing to her. But Steph's nan the year before had died of dementia. So she had to interview Steph, and I didn't know any of this at the time. Um, and Steph had said to her, it's really weird. It's, it's like he's got dementia, like, because I've been seeing my nan. It's like, but I know he hasn't because he's too young. And of course, the specialist couldn't say anything. And the next thing, that was it. Like, you know, got the diagnosis. And like I said, the specialist called us over the phone because we couldn't have a face-to-face -face meeting. And uh, he was like, you know, and they, they send the brain scan through and there's like big damage in there and stuff like that. And Steph said to him, oh, you know, have you seen someone with a one-off incident with this? And he went, oh, yeah. And she relaxed and she went, oh, I finally went, oh, no, he's dead. Someone that's got that much damage in a one-off incident is dead. It was in a head-on car accident, whereas mine's the sub-concussions, where it's caused by lots of blows. And then what it does, it dies gradually. And that's what's happened to parts of my brain. And that's why I seem like I work quite well. I talk and stuff, but my memory... And then also some, like obviously my emotions and stuff like that's all over the place. And that's because it sort of rewired itself, but not I was quite correct. About, I was going to ask about emotions, because obviously you play much more with, with, with tins, but you, you know, I had the opportunity to go and play with you in England camp. And we'll obviously talk a little bit about that later, some of the funniest stories. But obviously I knew you always as very kind of uh, straight talking, very down to earth, not overly emotional and stuff. But obviously you, uh, before we did the show, I remember sending around to lads, I read in the papers that you were talking about the... the suicide they'd gone to a train station and stuff like that i mean i i know people in i don't know anyone has gone to the same situation as you but just mentality wise like what how did you get into that mindset were you surprised and, and what what made you not go through with it um it's weird like I've, I've i've spoken honestly over the last few days about it and stuff like i used to think people that committed suicide was weak. Yeah. It sound, and I know people's and people, family members and stuff like that. And it sounds awful me saying that, but I just want to say where I've gone, come from, and where I am now. And I thought they were weak. It was like, just what are you doing? When you're in that moment and you're there, it's just like you're the most selfless person there is, because you just feel that you just everyone else is is Better worth a lot more. Yeah. yeah. And you and you just there and you there. And I was holding onto this bloody this fence, like just crying, just thinking. And then suddenly then, luckily I had like my phone, I took my phone out, my, my kids were on the front of the phone, it stopped it, whereas now I've gone to my neuropsychologist and he said, I sound like one of these bloody Americans, don't I? <laughs> I come from a counsellor. You've got changed, own, mate. I've got my own therapist now, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. You have changed. Uh, and suddenly, you know, it's things like, you know, Steph's perfume, it's, 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 it smells and stuff like yeah. that. And it's, it's really weird with the damage, I've got a massive nostalgia, like 70s, 80s music, love it. And it's like all the old days and the old chat and then I was, with the, the rugby stuff, like I've got the period of about 10 years that's just, there's nothing there whatsoever. Whereas like my Colts days and stuff, and I still go and see those lads and have dinner and stuff like that. And, you know, we, we, we have, and I, I can remember that, but it's just the other big chunks, there's just nothing there. Wow. Is it every day is like a, a, literally a school day? You're finding ways to better operate, to A, keep yourself, you're emotionally more stable. Yeah. You understand what works better for you now because of the... Yeah, it's more like, like you said, routine. Like I've got a Peloton bike, so I live off the Peloton, and it's, that's sort of my, my punishment. If I start feeling a bit down or tense, I just go on that as well. So I'm like trying to get into my fitness a bit more again and stuff. But, and like I said, it's, the last few days have been a nightmare because I've been here, there, and everywhere, and it just blew me out a bit. And um, so I had a bit of a wobble, but it's, once again, it's Steph and the kids. Like I said, look, I've had enough. I called off two meetings, just went home, had a night home with the kids in my bed and then just level myself out. So I'm, that's, you know, I'm starting to understand what I need to do. Yeah. But, you know, like I said, Alex Popham's been one of the ones just leading from the front on this. He's just been phenomenal. But there's just so many stories. Like, there's, you know, it was three of us, then there was seven of us. Now there's 175 that have been tested and, and got this diagnosis. And there's a lot more waiting as well to be tested. It's, it's just massive. And it's lads with seizures. It's lads, so many lads have tried to commit suicide. People have committed suicide. 
and now we're starting, there's, those stories are starting to come out and it's just horrendous and that's why you know, I came out of rugby completely like these two, you know, you, you love the rugby, you stay it, you know, you do this, you do that, which is brilliant, you know, because it adds to the sport. For me, I just wanted to get out, you know, I played rugby and I'll be honest, it wasn't my massive love. You know, I love like being with the lads, having a laugh. You know, I went from building site, like council house building site to literally, oh, you can play rugby and you only have to train a few hours a day to being on the, on the building site 12 hours a day, traveling up and down from Liverpool up to, um, from London up to um, Northampton. So, you know, for me, it was, it was a good way of, of an easy life, really. And, um, you know, when, when I look back now, you know, would I, people say, would you have done it again? And I, personally, I wouldn't. I wouldn't really? do what I, would be where I am now if I had the choice. Whereas I hear some of the lads, which is a bit where they're apologising to the missus, they apologise to the mum and dad, saying, oh, I'm so sorry what I'm putting you through. And then someone says, would you do it again? And they go, yeah, of course I would. And you're a bit like, well, for me personally, that's my side yeah. to it. We, we were talking off air about, because obviously, like you said, it started off with six of you, then built up, now 175. But actually, because some people in, in different quarters have, have questioned, you know, whether it's an attempt just to get money or what the story is, but you actually were telling to us before that there's actually a lot of rigorous, test, rigorous testing. So the people who have tried to jump on oh, and, and they're getting looked at the scan there's nothing there yeah no no it's nice I've spoke to him because I'm I'm not money on trade at all I'm not like fairly, you know I've, I've gave money back to play rugby and stuff like that and I've done you know stuff and you know money's never been my number one objective and stuff so when I came out with this I'll be honest it's kicked me in the balls by doing it because I've had to stop jobs I'm not allowed to go on big building sites and stuff now you know it's the but I've dragged my wife into it as well because she wasn't with me when I was playing rugby. She, I met her at the end. So it's like, you know, for, but I know it, it's weird. I can look in the mirror and I know I'm doing the right thing. At the beginning, when I first came out, I was getting messages like, <coughs> we hope your kids get run over because you've, ri you've ruined our kids' dreams. We respected you, whereas now we don't. You know, all that sort of yeah. stuff. And it was a bit like, bloody hell, but I knew I was doing the right thing. So I just kept going. And now, you know, we've had stories, you know, I've met a, a chap last week and, you know, I don't want to scare people because I, you know, we go down the junior rugby club, Willington, down the roads. I love it. It's a proper rugby club. You know, I, I, we go down there with my kids. Would I let them do tackle rugby? They're not old enough yet, but I wouldn't at the yeah. moment until we, we start real assessing and making sure everything's right around it. But I'm getting the nice stories as well, where this chap turned around to me and said, look, my son took a head knock the other week. And he said, he, he, didn't, he wasn't knocked out. And half the parents were a bit like, no, no, he's fine. And the other was like, well, we're not sure. And he said, as a parent, I was still like, I know he wants to play, but yeah. he said, we didn't, we pulled him off. And that was automatic three weeks off now. Whereas in the old days, they still said there was three <coughs> weeks, but then no one ever really done it. Yeah. It was never supervised. Whereas now, so he said, and I was like, all oh, right, and he said, that's good. He went, no, no, that's not the story. I said, what? He said, literally two days before the three weeks were up, he started showing symptoms. He started like getting lethargic. At school, his work started going a bit fun. And, and that's when it kicked in. And he said, Steve, if you and and Alex and all these like, hadn't come out and said, he said he would have carried on that game and he would have played two more games since then. As a young man that's at school, that's doing... So for me, like, that's a bit of a win. I don't want the game to finish, then you know, have it, but he can have his periods out now, he can reset and then he can go back in and play. So it's, it's like anything, you don't pull a calf and then suddenly play the next week. Yeah. And it's one of them, let's just look after everyone. Let's you know, look after the game. We want the game to carry on going because it's a fantastic game. You know, people are here tonight because of it. You know, yeah, friends it's and family. Yeah, friends and family, and that it's amazing. Like I said, I love going down the rugby club. The buzz around it, you know, touch rugby with the kids, the older boys up there, and you know, I just, I just love the whole thing about about rugby. Yeah. But it's just, let's make it safer if we can. It, what? So, would you say your relationship with rugby is still quite healthy in terms of you are going down the club? But then the biggest problem is it's quite easy to make change at professional level quite quickly. Whereas, do you find that going down your local club, you see, it's always normally the dads that volunteer to do it. <coughs> Sorry, we really did have a good night last night. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, still the same thing, they pull out the tackle shields, the kids are just running head, head into tackle shields. Is that the stuff that you really see the end game is where the support isn't there? We need to make sure the education's way better. Yeah, because I, I look at it and it's, it's a sh not a shame, but I... I've just got so much respect for these parents that go out on a Sunday morning when it's freezing cold, you know, it's stuff. and you, I couldn't coach kids. 
and stuff like that. You know, I, 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 couldn't, I can't even coach adults. Do you know what I mean? It's just, yeah. I just couldn't do it. Um, whereas they are superb. You know, they're unbelievable. The amount of time they go in there, they do it, you know, and you just think, thank, it's a, a, a thankless task. But when, when it's just the knowledge, and what I like about the knowledge at the moment, even when they're doing touch rugby as such, say they're on the sidelines and suddenly two of them cash heads, people are talking about it now. So it's those little times like that that are doing it. Like I said, with the tackle shields and stuff like that, you think to yourself, do we really need to do that at the moment? Yeah. You know, that's, you know, for me, I'd rather them build up the skill set and run around because you, know, you go and watch some rugby tournaments and I don't want to get like, but they just get into tackle. And what happens is you've got the young, little skillful kids that touch that are quite good. And then suddenly so just start going to tackle and then it's the big kids. And I've got, I was, big kid so it's like give him the ball and he'll just run over everyone yeah he's got no skill set there and all he's learned is he'll run over everyone for a couple of years and everyone catches up with him then he starts getting knocked around and he either learns some skills or he goes off i think there's so many different ways i didn't play rugby till i was 15 16 i started late i was basketball football i was i was doing everything i possibly could you know i had a skill set where someone like Hass doesn't you know what I mean? he lifts weights <laughs> and stuff like that that way that's the third <laughs> bit of shit you're giving me <laughs> Remember his fucking show. <laughs> <laughs> um, that is true. Though. Your story, I mean, you can hear a pin drop time. Your story is unbelievably powerful. And full, full kudos to you for the way you're telling it and the journey you're on. Can I just ask you, it, it doesn't appear that you're getting full respect from within the family, though, because I understand your daughter is potentially taking a little opportunity left, right, and centre. Is that yeah, right? Well, you're never going to get respect off a scouts, are you? That's no, I'm a stubborn. <laughs> you know I mean? It's not one of them. <laughs> but no, like, so there are times like, where I'm forgetting stuff and that, so I'm, I'll be looking and, and the kids now know the sort of, oh, you're going to take the piss out of me now, I know you are, like, well, I've got a gormless look sometimes. <laughs> are sometimes. you feeling right now? <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I think he's having one of his turns. Be, uh, <laughs> I, I, I saw that a lot when, uh, when Benny Kay had called the line out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oi. He had a skill set, it just didn't connect to your brain. Yeah. <laughs> You know I'm throwing it because I've closed my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, yeah, he did that a lot when you threw it, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, yeah, she's, so she, she knows, so she's looking at me and it's like, I just, I just can't remember the names. So I'm there and I'm looking and she's like, you can't remember my name, can you? And I was yeah, can you? And she's like, three guesses, if not five quid. So straight away, honestly. She, <laughs> she's, she's a scouser. Scouser. Yeah, yeah, she's exactly. Scouser. Well, no, he's a scouser. She would have nicked the money anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but then he gets his wallet out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure yeah. yeah. No, you didn't, Dad. Yeah, you, did. yeah. you know what kids are like? They pull out, yeah, don't worry, I'll take it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. contactless. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, I, I, I wanted to tell you, I said that, you know, obviously, whether you've used this to your advantage, you come home steaming and the missus is like, you forgot the dinner. You're like, oh, the, the old dementia yeah. again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know. That gormless look. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, have you used it yet or not? Yeah. Weaponized no. it yet? No, not yet. Not yet. Not yet. But I will do it at some point. Sure you don't want to do, don't want to do something. He's yeah, not so. telling that at a live show, no. No. Right. Oh, yeah, he'll insult me at a live show, but he won't admit that he's used Dimension <laughs> to get away with, like, free parking and stuff. What's amazing about your... And we'll come, we've got lots and lots of things to talk about. Your life is amazing, actually, Tom. It really is, the, the journey that you've been on. But it's interesting you say that rugby wasn't really a massive love, and yet you've stood at the very top of the game, which is, you know, is an extraordinary thing. Do you keep the memorabilia? Do you keep, you know, where's your medal these days? Do you look back now? You've got the shirt on the wall and the medal in the No, in the um, so I'm doing a documentary at the moment, so it was like, right, you must have memorabilia, you must have all this sort of stuff. And I was like, I've got, no, like, I've got nothing. And they said, well, where is it? I said, I, I don't know. So I was phoning, I'm like, this is it. I was phoning around my friends. And I said, look, has anyone got bags or anything of my stuff? And then one of my mates, Simon Heifer, whose brother's Ali Heifer, who's um, coach at Exeter, he was like, I've got a bag in mine, I think. So we go around there, and there's this, I've got a big bag, and then this little bag like that. And as I pull out, it's like my 50th cap mushroom thing that you yeah. get. And then my World Cup medal, my MBE, but it's like all rusty and stuff in the bag. And then my, my shirt, my first cap shirt's, in my brewery down um, Gosport there. So that's my one England shirt that I've got. And then other than that, that's no. I've got like a bag of odds and sods that was also in his garage that was like... What did you do with it all? I mean, the, the, the kit I, and stuff. I'm not just, just, I don't know. I oh. don't know where any of it is. Probably eBay by someone. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I think that's probably more like yeah. it. You just don't let a tax <laughs> man know <laughs> you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can't remember. She also got it all within my locker and came and literally yeah. cleared everyone out, didn't he? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so yeah, so I've, I've got, got all of my... It's weird. I've, I think I've all like... I've got one shirt of every every man. I don't. I, it's all in bags in a loft. Um, I know what you think when you walk into my house. Just first of all, mirrors so I can yeah, check myself yeah, yeah. out all the time. 
then bronze statues, <laughs> pictures of me, you know. There's one tiny picture of Chloe, but when she's not there, I just turn it over and put it down. <laughs> put the cap over, yeah. yeah. They no. just flip the face over. Like yeah. Yeah. No, thank you. Yes. Um, no, but I, it's, not, it's not like that. I've got a couple of bits, but yeah, yeah I'm I've, saying, got I've, got, I've got all my match shirts and the ones I've swapped. Uh, my medal is is hugging, my medal's hugging the bar, but it's sort of drowned by four. I've seen world, that. Yeah. yeah, four world gold medals, European silver medal, <laughs> Olympic medal. <laughs> <laughs> There's the soundbite. Yes. 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 It's, it's very, it's very annoying for. when your your biggest thing is is just drowned by someone who's better. I remember seeing that bar. I remember going, what is it, What are all these yeah. like piles yeah. of medals? And she went, oh, I think Mike's under there. So I was like, <laughs> a couple of hours later, she's still folding. I was like, oh, don't worry You'll about it. You'll get there in the end. Oh, it's not worth it. Uh, Used to open the bottles. So a, you, you, not, not being into the England memorabilia, is there, a, is there other shirts and moments? Because you were talking about your Colts days. Yeah, actually. my Colts, they're the ones that I love the best. That's really? the ones I really remember, yeah. And uh, playing for East Midlands at the County uh, Cup final. And we played at Twickenham. And like we were like... One of these teams we just chucked together, like, and then we played against uh, Joe Worsley and Josh Lucy in the final, and they were all private school boy wankers. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> and then it was us lot. He didn't mention my name, but it sort of feels like he might be talking about me again. Yeah. But, I'm, well, but also, there's yeah. one of the biggest ones here. He went Look. to Eton and Edinburgh. So, oh, shut up. if you're looking for a publisher wanker, <laughs> yeah. there's a Lord Fauntleroy on the end here. <laughs> He's like, yeah. He's not putting the finger out anymore. Yeah, You've yeah. Taught, taught him the dark know, side. Like, you probably wrong. used to work for his dad or something like that, you know, haven't <laughs> they? How's the drains in the bottom field, Tom? Yeah. <laughs> I know how so big your shits are, anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that, that's the that shirt that you... you, you no, yeah, that's the mem memory yeah. display. I love it. I've never asked you this. If you could pick one shirt, what would it be? Uh, um, I, could be. Uh... <laughs> But it's not. It was not. <laughs> yeah. it, oh, that was so sweet of you. Oh, it, it, it maybe <laughs> could be. No, no. I, we always lost in finals at Quakes. That was the only problem. Uh, we always lost to Colston's. Um, yeah. You, uh, did, you did something the other day with World Rugby. Have you got a shirt that you would um, mean the most? Not really. Oh. Which uh, I tell, quite enjoyed the Highlanders one because that was well, well and obviously the Stade Francais, yeah, um, just for their sheer loudness and you know the, the, the craziness of them. Fitted you well. Didn't they? It did yeah. fit me well, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but no, I say that you know the Highlanders as well, just because for me it was a massive testament of actually being able to go and do that. You know, a lot of players at the time, I think, um, I think Julian White had maybe gone over and done something in New Zealand before. Rob Andrew had done something years ago, but I was. One of the only players. That's where John learned his trade. Yeah, in yeah. New Zealand, it? yeah. And and I was one of the first ones to play Super 15, and especially for a New Zealand team, it never really been done before. So that for me was a real special moment, just because everyone said I was gashed and didn't have a skill set. <laughs> Turns out I did. Went global. <laughs> You're welcome. I... How many caps, cheeky devil? <laughs> Seventy-seven, sir. <laughs> <laughs> How many books? Six. Thanks for asking. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Yeah. Shut Releasing up. music. <laughs> lots of it. Sorry, <laughs> enough about me, but let's talk about me. The are very good at holding <laughs> doors open. They're not. If you need a leaflet, it's very light. Um, yeah. I, th I think, because I didn't really didn't win anything at club, so for Gloucester and Bath, I didn't, we won the Parker Pen Shield or whatever it was at Gloucester at the time. We were talking about it today, weren't we? Finished top of the league, God knows how many seasons, when they brought in the playoffs, so it meant nothing. Yeah. Um, but I, I would, it'd have to be an England jersey, and I think uh, my favourite... I, uh, the 2000 tour to South Africa is always my favourite because not only did we go there and we got our first win in South Africa for God knows how long and then we didn't lose to a Southern Hemisphere team from 2000 till 2004. Um, it really sort of kick-started the belief in that team. I think it was the most important game, that second test in Bloemfontein. Uh, plus it was um, the best night out after. <laughs> it, was, it, was the, um, it was the old, the last proper old school tour. So we'd, we'd basically, again, this could be a rabbit hole where I get us in trouble. Uh, we, we basically beat, won the second test, but it was an old school tour. Don't warn them so they get the phones out. <laughs> Say it and then, <laughs> and then go, shouldn't have said that. And then we, so then we went, um, we basically went midweek, test match, midweek game, test match, midweek. So we finished the second test. We've still got a midweek game to go. Clive pulls up all the, f the first team and the test team and goes, right, lads, 
unbelievable. That is unbelievable uh, what you've done. It's going gonna, it's gonna to completely change this team. But the midweek game, midweek team have still got a game on Wednesday, so I don't want to see you for four days. Listen, we've got your book here tonight, and it is for sale um, outside in the foyer if you are grabbing I hope one or two of you have grabbed a copy or three. Um, it's a hell of a story. I mean, and, and there's so many things we'd love to talk to you about. But you touched earlier on the fact that you broke your neck, half a million quid payout. A little bit more, yeah. A little bit more. Then paid it back to go back and play again. Uh, a lot more, because I, like a twat, I took it to France, and the euro and the pound flipped, so I ended up... Right. <laughs> I was, it wasn't invested in the Bank of Hask, let's put it that way. Right. I'm That's... never paying back that, ever. No. <laughs> tell me why. why. Why the lure to go back again? Um, there's, there's one thing. That there was an old boy, Keith Picton, who saved me, really, massively. He's the one, when I got into the Saints, early doors of the Colts, he's, he's the one that gave me money. Like I was, got kicked out of home, so then I was having to sort of just work on the sites and then you, we were training and playing like like the amateurs sort of thing training Tuesday and Thursday nights and stuff and every time we stopped off for food I wouldn't have money because I was having to pay rent and stuff like that and he always looked after me like that but then also he taught me like if I got into trouble because I was a bit of an idiot when I was a kid normally in the Saints if you got into trouble when you were in the youth team you got kicked out but he always backed me so what he used to make me do when we're on the buses on the way back and we've had a few beers people are pissing and that all over the place and it's like going up and down the bus and then I was Steve, Steve, yeah, sorry, it was, like I said, we were council house kids, we weren't the posh ones. <laughs> he used to make me stay behind and I'd have to clean up the bus and stuff like that. And it's like, right, you should be getting kicked out, but I'm doing this for you. And it sounds weird, it's like a tough love type thing. And I just loved him to bits. And um, when I played for England, he, he turned around and he said, look, I'm not interested in coming to your first test. I want to come to your 50th test. Uh, and, and when I got back, that's, that's what he'd done. Amazing. So, also, but I, when I got injured, I got injured in '47. Right. So then it was like that couldn't happen. So that when it, one of the main driving things was like, I just want to, I want him to do that. Yeah. Incredible. So what was life in France like? Because you mentioned you had got a hell of a sort of journey to get to that point. But I mean, as a, as a culture transition, did you love it? Um, yeah. Like it's weird because I went there and I couldn't really remember much, and then. I must have been, when I stopped playing, my brain must have stopped being inflamed as much and stuff. And then there's a slight bit that I remember slivers. Um, but it is a bit of a comedy, did that really happen? Because when you're a professional rugby team and you're on away games in France, there's some long bus journeys. Like you, you know, and so that over in France, you've either got the places where you stop on the side of the road and they've got little holes in that you've got to try and piss and stuff, like, or you've got the proper ones, sandwiches and all that. So of course, we stop at the sandwich ones. And, I was, I was helping out with signing players. We've got a lot of South Africans and Brits over, and Andy Good, obviously, he, he loves a sandwich. And a <laughs> <clears throat> so we're stopping off, and then suddenly Lawrence Sen, the head of rugby, starts going off. He's like, this is disgusting, you, you bloody Brits and your sandwiches. So he stopped us stopping at them service stations. We had to go with the ones with the holes. But him and the French lads used to get off and have two fags. <laughs> right. But these are the players. Like, They'd have two, so we weren't allowed a Mars bar, but they could have like 10 Marlborough light, do you know what I mean, or something like that, before a game. Unbelievable. And Only in France. Yeah. Amazing. But, they, but they'd light up at half time as well, wouldn't they? Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's well, mad. A... I mean, you go, this is professional rugby. And like, Bolsh, Bolsh went to Beer Ritz, and obviously he asked you, you, you went over to Stad, and Bolsh, I was like, how is it, mate? He goes, it's awesome, but you've got to learn to not be professional again. It's going back to amateur. You don't have any training facilities. You basically every, walk, turn up to training, everyone's having a bind outside, then you get changed, go and train, then you have a smoke after training, <laughs> then you go home and have a coffee, and that's it. He just said, you've got to get used to being so unprofessional. Well, it's like that story with uh, Julien Dupuy. So Julien Dupuy went over to play for Leicester, fantastic scrum half, and they were playing in, um, a, I think it was a European Challenge Cup final or a, or a final, and it went to, um, he basically came off with 10 minutes to go, no one noticed where he went, disappeared, and um, it obviously went to extra time, and then it went to penalty kick, penalty kicks, and that's where Jordan Crane, if you know about rugby, he, he got, the, got the kick, but when it came, when it came to putting him on, Julian Dupuis is a fantastic goal kicker, kicker, and everyone's like, well, where the fuck's Julian gone? Because right, normally, uh, when you come off the field, you'd sit with your teammates, you'd be there cheering them on. Last thing Julian was seen walking down the tunnel, right? So they've, <laughs> they've, they've sent the kit man to look for him. They're going everywhere. And they just found him in his pants, having a tab, 
in the changing rooms, just smoking, watching the game on the TV. <laughs> and I'm like, Julian, you, you fucking need to get on the field and do the kicking. He's like, oh, pardon. <laughs> right? Put his boots on, didn't even do the shoelaces, just ran up, kicked it, and by the time the ball went over, he was already dieting up again. <laughs> Amazing. No, he's mad. But that, for those, like, that French lifestyle is insane. Like, you know, I was very lucky to go to Stade Francais. Um, and, you know, I, I, left, I left WAS. Um, and at the time, you know, I was 24. Um, you know, nobody really ever left WAS and was successful. Everyone was saying, oh, you're a money grabber, you're an asshole, your career is never going to make it anywhere. Mainly my dad. <laughs> Shut up, dad. <laughs> Why don't you love me? Um, <laughs> getting quite deep there. No, um, so I signed for Stanford, so I got an opportunity to go there and, and play with these amazing players. You know, Sergio Parise, Dimitri Sarzeski, Juan Hernandez, Julian Dupuy, and Dimitri Sarzeski is maybe the most beautiful man in the world. He had long flowing, he looked like Fabio, the model, remember the model Fabio? He looked beautiful. And if he caught you in the right way and the light just reflected off his eyes, I'm not into lads, <laughs> but even I was a bit like, <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I was just a bit, because he was so beautiful, and then he, he'd do that, and there'd be like sparkles and animations coming out of his hair. Did, didn't quite work for Shane Byrne, did it? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Well, for some people, it might be into that, but you know. Um, but one of the reasons I went to Stad, you got to play with these players, but I got to, um, I went there because they're a very, very flamboyant. Um, owner, a guy called Max Cuisini, and he was like a proper club owner. And that's the thing in France, they have these mad owners. Toulon owner, we know stories about that, but Max was amazing. He took Stade Francais from the fourth division to champions of France, and he was famous for a number of things. Um, pink shirts, right? He, he was the first team to have the pink shirts, and also this calendar called the Jeu de Stade, right? Whoa, this calendar, right? Great no, days of great, life. No, I think they were the greatest days. I'll tell you why, just because when you're playing over here, you'll, you'll agree with it. The big weekends were the, the European weekends. You know, going away to Toulouse, Castres, Toulon, you know, Perpignan, and going over there and signing for, for Stade and playing with those superstars. And yeah, the culture's mad. You know, like the culture with the, you know, just the smoking, you know, three, all of them smoking. Three, yeah. Three, right? co three course meal before a game with yeah. red wine. I mean, yeah, we, had, one, yeah. we had a training session once, right? And I got there early because the old body was a bit tired. And I was doing laps of the field with Ollie Phillips, right? And it was like five minutes before the session. And the usual suspects were having a tab and a little espresso. It was like nothing unusual. But where the fuck was the rest of the lads? Right? And suddenly, bloke turns up with a pasting table, three other lads with shopping bags. And I'm still running up, warming up, stretching, being professional. And They've set this table up, tablecloth, three bottles of wine, some saucisson, sauce, some baguettes, some pâté, right? And all the lads have walked out, put the tabs out, you know, put the coffee, threw the coffees away, and they're all gathered around the table, right? I can see them pouring wine, they go, Eros beef. I assume that was us, like, nothing like, a bit of mild racism just to get you in the mood. <laughs> Came over, and I, and I was like, fucking lads, we've got training, it's 10 minutes after training. He goes, no, it's not a problem. We have a very special get a degustation from one of the lads who's brought the local produce. You'll enjoy some saucisson. So I was given a piece of bread, saucisson, pate, pint of wine, smashed it, boom, necked it, straight out into the training field. <laughs> Mental. Incredible days. I love Mental. it. Mental. One of the things that is always very interesting is when you cross paths with other elite level sportsmen and women in, in your thing, because I wanted to ask you about playing golf with Tiger, because you also, didn't you, run into Rory McIlroy somewhere as well. Do you like your golf? <laughs> <laughs> this is a good story. Do you like, do you, do you like, are, you, are you a golf no, fan? It was, it was just before he bottled it that first time in the Masters. Um, so I'm not sure if I gave him the wobbles or not. But uh, we played in Ireland in, what was it, 2011 was it? The yeah, game? it was two Grand Slam 2011, game. the Grand Slam game. And I'm on the bench and I'll come on, do the usual and score from 40 metres. But still, we'd, <laughs> we'd lost by quite a bit. <laughs> And, um, yeah, that was that was the only. You know, shit's bad when you're getting pumped. And the best moment of the day was Steve Thompson running in a 20 metre trial, 30 metre, 40 metre, 40, 40 metre try. You know what I mean? That's the highlight of the day. This biff of bin with a face just running down the side of the thing. And so but, after, uh, afterwards, so we're in the there, and suddenly there's this lad with a real shit haircut, like all this, and he's sort of hanging around the VIP area thing. So. And started talking to him, chatting to him. And I said, oh, what do you do then, mate? And he's like, oh, you know, I'm a golfer and all this stuff. So I'm getting on with him. And suddenly someone said, oh, that's Roy McIlroy. And I was like, oh, okay. I said, and then it turns out he's like one of the investors at Ulster Rugby Club yeah, and stuff yeah. like that, isn't he? Yeah, and stuff he paid like that. a lot of the salaries and, and stuff. And yeah. stuff like that. So he looks, anyway, so I said, look, do you want to come in? The doorman's like, he's not coming in. The fair play, he said, he's not coming in the air. I said, look, mate, I don't mean it's rude. There's like 30 rugby lads for there. If you kick off here, you're going to get it, sort of thing. So, <laughs> 
we get this, get him in, and we're all chatting, and before you know it, I might have got a little bit personal with him. <laughs> because <laughs> that, the that next... context, I think. Yeah, because then the next day, all I get on Twitter is, like, a bit of abuse, but in a nice way from him, and thanks so much for the hickey. And then I think, apparently, I gave him... And the other one is the... Lewis Moody said I might have hung him off the, bu the balcony as well. <laughs> that, that night was so ra random. Obviously, we lost a Grand Slam game. I'd, I'd, I'd got injured the week before against Scotland. Fodes and Danny Kerr were then talking to Louis Walsh, singing to him, saying, could you put us in a band? <laughs> I'm like, lads, we lost, <laughs> we've got Rory McIlroy hanging by his ankles over a balcony. We've got these two singing to Louis Walsh. I'm like, what the fuck's going on? And then, um, and then um, uh, the Eddie Irvine, the driver, yeah. Eddie Irvine and the other F1 guy turn up and they pissed um, Vicks off so much. Vic, he was like, do you think you could lift me above your head? And Vicks was like, yeah, of course I can. Like, just picked him up, threw him onto a sofa. I was like, what is going on tonight? <laughs> I don't know what's happening, but I like it. Crystal's nightclub in, uh, in Dublin. Make but sure I, you're there. I had a nightmare because I'd I got a drunk and I'd walked in to the VIP area and, and there was this little short guy with tight curly hair and he went, I learned like Grand Sam. And I looked at him and I was like, fuck off, pubed, or I'll burn your shit lid off. <laughs> <laughs> and then just and just walk, and I just swam past him, like moved down the way, carried on the piss. Anyway, so went back round. I'm a bit of a star sucker, so I came back round and went, oh. Rory McIlroy's in there. I went, is he? I said, fucking hell, go in, go in there. And I went, yeah, probably, probably won't be spe speaking to you again. So yeah, never mind. How to make friends and influence people. That's my book, book to four. I'm conscious of time, and I want to finish just with both of your memories of playing with this man here. And I mean, you won a World Cup with him. You've stood at the top of the game. I mean, it's such an honor to have you here tonight. It's been a real treat to have you and your story, but playing alongside him, he said he was a, a dirty bugger at times, but <sighs> what a player. Now, um, yeah, I mean, like, because Tomo came in, uh, we were just talking about it upstairs, Tomo came in 2001, the year after, sort of, myself, Benny Cohen, um, Bolsh, uh, you'd come in at the same time as Jason. So it was really the sort of new era of, and even though he is a, he's a, big man, he wanted to play rugby, um, he wore the work, those fucking horrible gloves, those optimum gloves, yeah, fingerless gloves. Those. You were goody. He still can, still can throw in straight. But, you know, he, you know, you talk about people who came in and influenced that group in a positive way about how we wanted to play and fast tempo, but then also could run it in from 50 and, but also do the nuts and bolts at the same time. It was just another evolution on the journey of that team. And um, he was good on the socials. He had to protect Ben Cohen quite a bit because Ben Cohen, you know, the story about Ben Cohen when he, he, got, he pissed off all the Welsh fans because of Shane Williams comment. Ben Cohen's generally deaf, isn't he? I'm a bit stupid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So he basically couldn't hear him when he went, Shane who? And, but then to Tom, Wally basically walked around most of the time just sort of making sure that everyone didn't hate Ben Cohen, uh, which was a big role in his life. But, yeah, I mean, what he did for the team, it, you know. It, it, I mean, look, I, I know I was very lucky to have a bit of time with, with, with Steve in, in the England squad, obviously. <laughs> you tell the... Yeah. And so, um, I mean, firstly, you know, a, a credible a man. We, we, you know, we are on the surface very, very different, obviously different, different backgrounds, but we always, always got on. You know, you were an incredible... Um, professional and you know a great player and actually for a big for a big lump with a big dumper you had real good skill set and everything else so like it, you know and you were, we had a lot of good times together what more can I say final question to you Stephen it's been interesting hearing that there's so much of the glory of your career is, is not there it doesn't, it doesn't feel like a sort of a tangible for you at this point but I want to read you the quote from Sir Clive Woodward. Because England had such an exceptional pack of forwards, I don't think Steve got enough recognition. If we lost him, he was irreplaceable. Steve was absolutely fundamental to us winning that World Cup. He never let me down. He was special. And when you hear that now... <laughs> you've, got, you've got a hell of a fight which you are taking on with unbelievable courage now but do you look back have you do you rewatch do you do you, do you want to sort of remember and, and revisit the glory on the field or is that a different lifetime <clears throat> no it's, it's just 
it's it's weird because Christ, I've had to watch it like so many times over the last few days with reports like, look, you must remember it. You must, and I'm like, I don't remember it. I, I really don't. And I'll be honest, when I'm watching it, and it's like I'm watching England now, but there's just a fat, ugly bloke and two that can't throw the ball. Do you know what I mean? So it's like... Jamie George ain't that bad. <laughs> <laughs> He's the only one that makes me look good. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, I'll be brutally honest, like, I, just, I feel like a bit of a phony when people come and ask me about it and stuff at times. I can, I can lie in two ways. I, I don't want to be rude and go, I don't know, because the last thing I want him to do is think, oh, he's arrogant, he don't want to speak to me. Or I can just go, oh, yeah, it was amazing, but I, I just, I don't know. I must, I just don't, didn't, there's nothing there. There's no sort of feeling towards it. And that's the most bizarre thing about it. That yeah. I so, watch it and I don't get any goosebumps. I don't get any of that. Even when stuff's going on, I don't get that stomach. It's just, it's just bizarre. Yeah. Tell you what, if someone comes up, it's a way of killing off the nose. Oh, tell us about 2003. Got dementia, don't remember it. <laughs> That, that, Guaranteed there's not a follow-up question, yeah, is yeah, there? Yeah. That is a great way of getting rid of it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's the... <laughs> and what about that? Obviously, we hope your book flies, but, but what's next? I've uh, got a documentary coming out, um, hopefully in July, July-ish. It should be finished at the end of May. Um, but once again, it's, it's sort of trying to highlight what it is and then also just try and help as many people as we can. Yeah. You know, I've started working now. Thank you. I've started working now with an um, uh, occupational health company called MediClinic, and it, it's all uh, Medigold, sorry. And what we're going to do, we're going to um, look at mental health, but then also the brain injury side to it, because like, I think there's a massive side to brain injury that people don't understand and look at now. But, you know, and also, you know, we're going to just keep going, and we're just going to keep rugby alive. You know, as much as people thought we were trying to kill it at first, that's why I think people got a bit like, oh, and excuse the phrase, like you got the lads that. I call it live off the tit of rugby, the ones that just keep milking it, Task. And, um... <laughs> <laughs> the parlour. <laughs> that was very odd. That was very different. <laughs> One minute I was milking, yeah. you saying I was doing something? You know, the group and everyone that we've done together, we're not there at all. We just, we want to make it safe. We want to be out there, and I believe we can do that. And I believe that, you know, rugby is, is, is for everyone still. And, yeah. you know, I love it. And I want my kids to be there. And in the future, would they play it? I'll look up and hopefully, hopefully they will because it's been made safe. It can never be totally, nothing's totally safe. Can't, can't cross the road, can you, without having the risk of being run over. But I think people just got to be aware of the yeah, risk. It's more about the care, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. The game is the game. It's, it's making sure that that care, you know, NFL went through it and then they decided to give everyone insurance for life. Anyone yeah. who's played the game would, be, would have cover for life and I think that's more where we, where yeah. we need to get to. Yeah. There are a lot of good people within the game and this is one of them, ladies and gents. We are incredibly proud, actually, of the fact that the good, the bad, and we no, no show is ever the same. And uh, I think tonight, certainly from my personal perspective, I know you two will agree, it's been unbelievable having you on. We are incredibly grateful to you for coming and telling your story. Thank you so much to all of you at the Liverpool Empire. You have been an unbelievable Not crowd. Painful. You are good rugby people. <laughs> and keep that flame alive up here. But for tonight, thank you so much for coming. Will you finish with an enormous round of applause for the Lord for Haas, but most importantly, to Steve Thompson, ladies and gentlemen, our special guest this evening. Well done, Tom Ogie. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful rest of your bank holiday weekend, and we'll see you again up here very soon. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. Safe journey home from us. It's good night.